The more observant of you may have noticed that Minnie is back. Last night, we had a piercing discussion about our relationship, and Minnie said, I really am sorry that I cannot offer you intimacy, but I can offer you intermagsy. Intermagsy instead of intimacy. I said, Minnie, I have two problems with you. One, you're not transparent. And second thing, your dark side is to emphasize. So I'm going to take one sip and discard you as all narcissists do. And instead, I'm going to have me a new transparent and stimulating relationship. Mm. Wunderbar. And now to the topic of today's um, convo, conversation. I'm going to discuss narcissists and borderline and how they conspire and collude to destroy all intimacy in a relationship. Why do they do that? How do they do that? And what are the very surprising outcomes? So stick with, it, with me throughout this video and you will be unpleasantly surprised at the end. For those of you who don't know me, luckily for you, my name is Sam Vaknin. I am the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and I'm a professor of psychology in several universities on several continents, Antarctica not included yet. But give me time. I'm still young and handsome and flourishing in this time of pandemic. Okay, okay, enough with the banter. Let's get to business, you all say. And to business we shall get. Nothing terrifies the borderline more than abandonment and rejection. Abandonment and rejection by anyone, by the way. Not only an intimate partner, but especially by the intimate partner. The reason is simple. The intimate partner regulates the borderline's internal landscape, regu regulates her ego functions. And so, without the intimate partner, the borderline feels empty, denuded, and it's annoying and annoying feeling. And we will see in a few minutes how she copes with it. Now, abandonment or separation uh, insecurity, the clinical term is separation insecurity, by the way, Abandonment anxiety or separation, separation anxiety, fear of rejection. <clears throat> they are actually uh, one of the they are part of the diagnostic criteria of borderline personality disorder in the fourth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, text revision. But they are also included in the alternative model of borderline personality disorder, which is the future model, the model that will take over once the DSM-6 is published. So it seems that abandonment and rejection, separation, insecurity and anxiety, these are at the core of borderline personality disorder. And it doesn't have to be real abandonment. It can be anticipated abandonment, imagined abandonment. Many, many innocuous acts, decisions and choices are often misinterpreted by the borderline to mean abandonment and rejection. And in the wake of such, of, of repeated such harrowing experiences, because for the borderline, to be abandoned and to be rejected is to be annihilated. It's a small, small death. It's a process of dying and resurrecting time and again. So in the wake of repeated such harrowing experiences, borderlines react in two ways, and they often alternate between the two solutions. Number one, some borderlines avoid all contact with potential intimate partners. They constrict their lives to their career or to the workplace. They become schizoid and avoidant. They stay at home. Many of them misinterpret this state or condition as shyness. They will tell you, I'm shy. Many of them mislabel their newly found schizoid tendencies and they say, I'm introverted, but they're not shy. And they're not introverted. And there's no such thing as a shy or quiet borderline. It's another nonsensical invention akin to empath. They're not shy and they're not introverted. They are simply avoidant. They are, they are fearful of pain. 
the pain of rejection and abandonment. So that's solution number one. And you can see millions of borderlines cocooned at home, never leaving home if they can, if, if they can um, afford it, and just um, staying in the nest, occupying or busying themselves to the best of their ability because borderlines suffer from boredom and from loneliness. And that's it. That's solution number one. Solution number two, as is usually the case with borderlines, is exactly the opposite of solution number one. Diametrically opposed, actually. Solution number two is sexual self-trashing. Some borderlines, in the wake of rejection or humiliation or abandonment, real, anticipated or imagined, sexually self-trash in casual, random sex, exclusively with strangers, which they pick up somewhere, in a bar, in a party, on a dating app. This way, by limiting their sexual encounters to random total strangers, these borderlines avoid experiencing heartbreak. They never experience heartbreak. They mitigate the pain of having been rejected. So they experience pain having been rejected and abandoned, and they kind of solve or, or use sex with strangers to feel better. They restore their wounded grandiosity with their conquests. They call it validation. Um, it's, it enhances their self-esteem. Attention and sex are the two main uh, staples in the borderline's uh, medicine, medicine cupboard. So they self-soothe. It's a form of self-soothing, similar, for example, to compulsive eating. So it's an addictive behavior. The second solution is an addictive behavior of sexual self-trashing. And when I say sexual self-trashing, I mean total self-trashing. I describe self-trashing in other videos, so you may wish to, to listen to them and to make the distinction between self-trashing and promiscuity. Promiscuity is agentic. Promiscuity is empowering. Self-trashing is about self-degradation, self-punishment. Borderlines self-medicate with anxiolytic predatory men. Now, the word anxiolytic is crucial here because when they have random self-trashing sex, their anxiety level goes down. So these men, these predatory men, they're the equivalent of anxiolytics, anti-anxiety medications. And these men often victimize the borderline. They mistreat the borderline egregiously, even in one night stands. And so this creates a dissonance. In both cases, in both solutions, there's a dissonance. In the first case, the borderline has to explain to herself, why is she isolating herself socially? Why is she avoiding contact with other people? Why is she cocooned at home? Why is, she, why is she so afraid to step out of the door? It's a form of attenuated agoraphobia, if you wish. And she has to explain this to herself, to herself because it creates a dissonance. The borderline regards herself as an emancipated, liberated, empowered person. And this kind of behavior, this kind of avoidant, fearful, shy behavior is runs counter to the borderline's self-narrative and self-image. So she has to explain to her why she's doing this. And she casts it, casts it in the terms of a choice. She says, I'm choosing to do this because I'm strong, because I'm empowered, because I'm agentic, I'm choosing this. I'm choosing this, I'm saying goodbye to the world. The world doesn't deserve me. Of course, it's a manifestation of grandiosity. Narcissists do exactly the same. They go into a schizoid phase when they cannot obtain narcissistic supply. Similarly with the second solution, which is random self-trashing sex with predatory abusive strangers. In this second solution, there's also a dissonance because truly empowered, liberated and emancipated women don't do that. <laughs> they don't render themselves trashy. They don't make themselves available to um, partners who are inappropriate to use another statement. They don't expose themselves to abuse. They don't court 
and seek maltreatment. They don't self-punish. They don't self-destroy and self-defeat. So there's a dissonance there between the behavior and the self-image. And in this case, in the second solution, the defense is fantasy. It's a defense against the mortification, the shame and the guilt involved in acting out, involved in being maltreated contemptuously by predatory men to avoid the dissonance between reality, harsh reality and uh, elevated, grandiose, inflated self-image to avoid this dissonance, to avoid mortification and the shame and guilt that come after these misbehaviors, the borderline immediately imposes a romantic or defiant fantasy on the stranger that she is with or and on the unfolding unsavory uh, proceedings. So she finds herself in a hotel room with a total stranger she's just met and she's forced or she acts in ways which are considered to be unusual for the event, extremely intimate or socially unacceptable. She has to explain this to herself. And this stranger is mistreating her in many ways. He gets her drunk, he expels her from the hotel room after the proceedings. She has to, to tell herself some story. And the story is a fantasy. The fantasy is, I was infatuated with him. There was something going on between us. There was a possible future there. He could have been my boyfriend. Actually, I felt that he is my boyfriend for the night. This is a fantasy defense. And this fantasy defense is used by borderlines not only in sexual self-trashing, but in all other forms of self-trashing. For example, substance abuse. They, they say, I choose to drink. I choose to drink because it makes me function better. It makes me more sexual. It makes me more sociable. So they justify they have self-justifying narratives which are founded on counterfactual um, claims and fantasies. That has to do with all self-harming and self-trashing behaviors. Similarly, borderlines justify cutting, self-mutilation, burning with, with the same fantasies or self-justifying claims. So let's recap this part. The borderline dreads rejection and, and the humiliation of abandonment. When she loses her intimate partner, she loses the capacity to regulate herself. She becomes dysregulated. So she's terrified of this ultimate condition. When she anticipates abandonment, when she is abandoned, or when there is imaginary abandonment, doesn't matter, she acts in two ways. Either she withdraws and avoids the world, and the intimate partner and justifies this by saying that it's a choice, an agentic choice, or she self-trashes. Sexually, she self-trashes via substance abuse. She self-trashes financially. She causes herself harm. She self-harms. It's a form of self-mutilation. She self-harms with men. She self-harms with, with uh, alcohol, but she self-harms. And to justify this self-harm, to reconcile the self-harming acts with the empowered, strong, emancipated, liberated, agentic me, this self-image, to reconcile these two, the borderline imposes a fantasy on what is happening. So if she, for example, is sexually self-trashing, she would say that she is not sexually self-trashing, the stranger is not really a stranger, he's a potential intimate partner, and what the stranger is doing to her, which is egregious mistreatment and maltreatment, what he's doing to her is consensual. She's doing it because she wants it, not because he wants it. Borderlines react with derision and hostility to any attempt to undo or challenge the fantasy. They cast well-meaning and caring therapists, friends, intimate partners and family members as persecutory objects, almost as enemies. You dare to challenge the borderline's fantasy, self-justifying just, self alloplastic defenses. It's not my fault. You dare to challenge any of this and you become the enemy 
and the borderline splits you. Borderline has a splitting defense mechanism, dichotomous thinking, black and white, right and wrong, all good, all evil. You switch, you can, you, you, she switches you from one camp to the other within a split second. You dare to challenge your fantasy. You transition from being her best friend to her worst enemy, to being her worst enemy. Unfortunately, for borderlines, they tend to pick narcissists as intimate partners and mates. Narcissists abhor and dread to true intimacy. They regard intimacy as a threat, a permanent challenge to their grandiosity. Narcissists are terrified of intimacy. Even the few narcissists, for example, compensatory narcissists, some covert narcissists, even the few narcissists who seek intimacy actively, they are approach avoidant. They seek it and then they flee away from it. So this approach avoidance repetition compulsion, this avoidant insecure attachment style, so is very characteristic of narcissists. So now you have an intimate partner who is afraid of intimacy, regards it as demeaning it humiliating and to be avoided at all costs. And on the other hand, you have the borderline who seeks intimacy almost as a form of medicine. She needs intimacy to regulate her internal uh, environment. She needs intimacy to survive. The absence of intimacy or the cessation of intimacy are a threat to her survival, to her functioning, to her life. But at the same time, Borderlines equally undermine intimacy because they are afraid of being engulfed or enmeshed. They are afraid to disappear. Borderlines are afraid to disappear because they don't exist. There's an emptiness, an empty schizoid core where a human being should have been. Both narcissists and borderlines are incarnations, reifications of emptiness. These are like two black holes meeting and merging. Both of them would repel each other because of the intense gravitational fields. The narcissism and the borderline seek intimacy, plunge into intimacy almost instantaneously in the love bombing and grooming phases. They, their affairs are intense like supernovas, giant explosions and irresistible to both parties, but both of them, each for his own reasons or her own reasons, are terrified of intimacy. As Richard Granlund says, intimacy is the narcissist's kryptonite and the borderline's kryptonite. So borderlines uh, are terrified of intimacy because they feel that intimacy will devour them. Intimacy will assimilate them and digest them. They feel that intimacy will remove all the outer layers and leave only the emptiness. It's like an onion. They feel they are being peeled by intimacy to leave nothing behind but the smell. And narcissists are terrified of intimacy because they regard intimacy as the common man's thing, something that makes them commoners, average, normal. And they don't want to be common, average, and normal. They want to be special and unique. So both parties fight each other, fight each other. The more they become intimate, the more conflictive or conflictual the relationship becomes, the more adversarial. The more they become intimate, the more they seek to destroy the intimacy, to undermine it, to challenge it. The more they act in ways which render intimacy impossible. For example, they lie to each other, or they cheat on each other, or they betray each other all in order to destroy the intimacy. The two parties abuse each other as they attempt to cause their partners to decompensate and to act out, in other words, to misbehave. This is projective identification. The parties push each other to abuse them. So the borderline pushes the narcissist to abuse her, and the narcissist pushes the borderline's buttons to make sure that she abuses him. And they want the abuse, because the abuse is an excuse. They, they now can legitimately cheat. They can, they can stray, they can betray, they can lie, they can walk away, they can destroy the relationship, they can break up. It's all legitimate. 
because they had been abused. Projective identification is about pushing your partner to behave or to misbehave in ways which restore your comfort zone. And the comfort zone of the borderline is actually a lack of intimacy. That's why borderlines are very comfortable with casual sex, where there's minimal to no intimacy. They, they're in their fantasy, even casual sex is imbued with intimacy. But in reality, of course, there's no intimacy or no intimacy to speak of. So the abuse in the relationship between narcissists and borderline is induced by both parties, affording them an excuse to break up and start all over again. Because if you break up with your intimate partner, he cannot reject you. He cannot abandon you anymore. Breaking up is the ultimate solution to abandonment, anxiety, separation, insecurity. You're alone, you're safe. You're with a stranger, you're safe. Stranger can't break your heart.